do want to alert I want to alert the audience that we are recording our uh, event this evening. If you don't want to be on screen, we certainly understand. In addition to our recording, we will ask that everybody stays on mute until such time uh, that we get to Q&A, and then we'll both open up the chat as well as open up the opportunity to speak directly to our artists. Thank you so much. Okay, we are ready to begin. Want to thank you all for joining us. Welcome to the Houston Center for Photography's Beth Block Honoraria Artist Talk. I'm Ann Layton Massoni. I am the executive director and curator at HCP. In a moment, I'll hand the evening over to our exhibitions and public program coordinator, Andre Ramos Woodard. If you joined us while our slideshow was looping, then you know that HCP has two exciting exhibitions up in our galleries our 40th Center Annual, and the Walter Hopp Zeitgeist Group Pop-Up Exhibition. Both exhibitions close on August 20th. At that point, HCP will close its doors for almost a month as we prepare for our fall exhibitions, brand new educational offerings, as well as ongoing outreach programming. Our ex exhibitions, education, and outreach would not be possible without your support. Any amount helps us in reaching our goals. I hope you'll consider donating to HCP today so that we can continue the important work we do. I'll be dropping a direct link in the chat for those of you who might be interested. When we get to Q&A, we are going to ask you all, and we'll remind you, but we are going to ask you all to send your questions directly to me and Masoni so that I can help facilitate the Q&A uh, along with Andre for this event. With that, Andre, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Appreciate that. Um, and thank you to everyone who is here to, uh, to I don't know, just to celebrate these artists. I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, well, to give you a little bit about me, because I'm not as important today, uh, my name is Andre Ramos Woodard, and I am the Exhibitions and Programs Coordinator at the Houston Center for Photography. Um, so this year's Center Annual, which is in its 40th edition, includes 50 works created by 25 artists from around the globe and was expertly juried by Lisa Volpe, who is the Curator of Photography at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Of the 25 artists selected to exhibit in the, in the 40th Center Annual, three artists are chosen to receive the Beth Block Honoraria Award. This award has been historically supported by the Beth Block Foundation and was formed to honor and continue the work of Beth Block. Uh, to give more insight into the work of who this award is for, uh, Beth Block was a young documentary and fine art photographer who explored fleeting everyday experience in a soulful, riveting manner. Her iconic images, a blend of an artistic and social documentary style, are found in various museums and private collections. So tonight, we are very, very, very happy to have the opportunity to amplify the work of this year's three winners, uh, Robin North, Renat Vasquez, and Jamie Ho. Uh, before we jump into things, I just wanted to, I mean, we just talked about it, um, but I'm going to let y'all know again. Um, so the artists are going to talk, and, and then after that, we will facilitate a group conversation amongst the artists in which you can send your questions to Ann Masoni, and she can, or one of us will, uh, I guess, ricochet them to the artist, uh, or if you are not shy, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and talk to the artist yourself. Um, so without being said, without further ado, um, our first speaker tonight is going to be Robin North. Uh, and Robin North uh, is an interdisciplinary visual artist based in Houston, Texas and San Diego, California. He holds a bachelor's of fine arts degree from the University of Houston with a concentration in photography and digital media. He is a presidential graduate research fellow and, ma and master's of fine arts candidate in photography and multimedia at San Diego State University in San Diego, California. His work ranging from alternative photography processes, installation, time-based media, experimental narratives, and mixed and digital media to photographic archives and research is particularly interested in the relationship between photography and history related to the African diaspora and African-Americans. 
As a contemporary artist of African descent, North engages visual arts to conceptualize, reinterpret, educate, and decolonize knowledge by challenging ideas and structures about race through a, through a theoretical lens. North aims to engage in public discourse on culture, race, and socioeconomic inequalities, challenging historical assumptions through, per, oh, sorry, uh, through speculative narratives rooted in lived experiences. North works towards a clearer understanding of our reflections on culture and his community's shared renderings of the past that help shape its collective identity, in which roots and routes of the African diaspora and creolization have been etched through the legacy of slavery. Um, and with, without real further ado this time, I'm gonna pass it over to Robin North. Hello, can everyone see that? Uh, yes, uh, I think you're good. We're good on this side at least. All right. So uh, thank you, uh, Andre, I appreciate the introduction and um, thank you, Anne, as well. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you to the Houston Center for Photography and being a part of the uh, 40th Center Annual and as well as getting uh, recognized as one of three of the best uh, block honorarium. It's um, really was a surprise and I'm really, really pleased to be a part of this. So thank you all. Um, First and foremost, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my practice um, and how I ended up um, creating this work called Decolonize Aesthetics. And it really started with my family's archives and our family being uh, really focused on finding a way to document our forced migration and how we ended up in the places and spaces that we've been and what are the things that make up our, our family DNA. Um, what um, what has been one of the most informative documents has been a document to the left. And this document was part of my family archives and it's um, a deed that has a lot of addendums that initially started in 1845. But in 1878, um, my third great grandfather, Sam Brown, bought 100 acres of land for 100 pieces of gold. We were trying to figure out how he had 100 pieces of gold and how we could by 100 acres of land. And uh, this document served as a roadmap to figuring out his forced migration. The name up to the top left, R. Gambles, is Robert Gamble. And as I started researching my family, um, this name kept popping up. And it turns out that Robert Gamble was Sam Brown's enslaver. And uh, his migration came uh, working our way backwards is from Texas to New Orleans, to Alabama, to Florida, and from Florida to Virginia. Robert Gamble turned out to be part of this aristocracy in Virginia and uh, went to Florida um, in search of riches in um, both sugarcane and cotton and ended up at a plantation called the Gamble Plantation in Ellerton, Florida. Nevertheless, uh, as I traveled and have been researching this name, this is how we've been able to mark the places and spaces that we've been. And a lot of the research um, here has been through New Orleans and Florida and Virginia and recently to the um, Library of Congress. Um, as I continued to trace my family roots, I started to really change my focus from looking at things far and wide to looking at uh, things through a personal lens and looking at it narrow and deep. And as, as I continued to do that, I started to go to these different places and spaces that my family was associated with during forced migration. And this field up to the top left is uh, a field that my grandmother, when we used to uh, ride to town, it's a rural area, she always wanted to go through these, um, these, these routes and dirt roads and everything else. And I didn't realize at the time that she was actually teaching me about my family history. And she would tell me that these cotton fields, there was blood in the soil. And that she used to, as a kid, pick, in, uh, pick cotton in these uh, cotton fields and our enslaved uh, ancestors picked cotton in these cotton fields. And so I went there and looked at it from a, from a critical lens and, and looked at it and started interrogating these places and spaces and started to realize that cotton was this theme that was directly associated with my family. Again, narrow and deep, I'm specifically looking at it from a personal perspective. And um, so I started going to these places and then I uh, went to 
this place called the Vanderbilt Farmers Co-op on the top right and started looking at how cotton production has been modernized, how these machines are doing all this work and started looking at this, this correlation with um, black bodies doing this work and how that meant and how those things were associated. And so as I went there, they started telling me about the cotton production and everything else. And I uh, benefited by them giving me this a bale of cotton from this, from this uh, co-op. And um, as I was engaging with this cotton, I was thinking about how can I use it? And um, so I decided that I was gonna create a project called decolonize. Well, it didn't start out as decolonized aesthetics. We all know how one body of work starts as one and it ends as another. And so um, I was really looking at this and how I could use that bill of cotton. And I used my relationship through the University of Houston to go out to Texas Historical Commission and get a chance to go through their archives and go through the warehouse. And they gave me this loose collar on loan that's on the bottom left. So uh, as you can see in the same image, over to the far, far left is that bale of cotton. And so uh, all of the people who are participating in this project, um, I showed them an experimental film and gave them a chance to engage with this loose collar. So um, the, the looks on their faces are because they just saw this film and engage with this torture device. And so when you see the look and a serious look on their face, it's because of that film is engaging with these artifacts and so on and so forth. So this, the, uh, the series ended up being called Decolonized Aesthetics. And one of the reasons was I wanted to reframe what it meant for black bodies to be in these subjugated positions and this, uh, in how the camera has been used to show a level of inferiority. And so um, uh, thinking about decolonizing that look, decolonizing those aesthetics, decolonizing those tools, have been very important in my work. And so as I've been showing this work, it's given me a chance to have dialogue about what it means and, and how um, looking at things from a creolized standpoint, meaning uh, multicultures, everyone, you know, you hear people think that blackness is one monolithic thing and it's not, it's a, it's, it's a, a multitude of different things. And so this quote from Audre Lorde, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And so as I looked at that and I started looking at the master's tools, I thought about even in death, having to trace Sam Brown's uh, forced migration through a Eurocentric name. And um, so I've continued to look at these things. And so when I look at these images like this one and how uh, black bodies are positioned, and how they're all shown to be in this inferior position, um, uh, all subjugated in, in a manner where um, other uh, Eurocentric aesthetics are, are raised to a different level. This one and how a number is used rather than a name. So these, and looking in the archives really informs my work. And that's how I ended up making this work. And I wanted to use a process of platinum palladium printing because it's considered you know, the king of prints. And um, it's a way to elevate and have a historical conversation about historical narratives and contemporary issues and reframe it in a way where you can speak uh, in, a, in a futuristic uh, standpoint. So you'll see a hint of Afrofuturism in some of these, these images and how this bale of cotton before was only used as um, a tool to enrich others, uh, these uh, 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 black bodies in the images are now repositioned and, and put in a position of, of power and leverage. So these images and this body of work was done through this platinum palladium uh, process. And a lot of people I found I didn't really know about it. And so quickly I wanted to share with everyone how this actually works. And it's, it's a dark room process. You're using and looking at different things with the humidity, how what the humidity is in the room because the humidity change and changes the aesthetic. Um, and you're using this really expensive emulsion, uh, platinum, palladium, um, oxalate, and all, all these other chemicals to control contrast and, and um, to create this image from a digital negative, which is what you see in the middle here to the left. Um, you essentially it's hand making, you're, you're putting this on different types of paper, all the paper matters, everything matters and using UV light to expose it 
then you're using a um, a developer, and depending on the developer, dep uh, changes the the look and feel of the image. Um, so, and then you go through this uh, wet bath type of process and and clearing agents and so on and so forth. Um, you're you're using a lot of scientific measures where you're using uh, different scales. This um, um, scale uh, step wedge is used so I can tell the differences if there's separation with different colors and percentages you're, you're looking at all these um, as you're creating this work and over to the bottom left is a lot of information that you're documenting because you're trying to your best to repeat the process as much as possible so you're keeping up with drops you're keeping up with uh, how the developer was warmed or not warmed what lot the paper came from because everything changes so um, this body of work is something that I've I've uh, really enjoyed. I've, I really appreciate uh, the Houston Center for Photography for recognizing it and uh, getting a chance to have conversation and dialogue about it. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, do you? Okay, there you go. There you go. All right. Cool. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Robin. That, that was an amazing insight to your work. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing that with us. Um, and as a reminder, do not blurt out any questions yet. I know that you guys are all screaming to yell at Robin about his work, but as a reminder, just send them to Anne, and we'll definitely politely be able to set, like, to facilitate the conversation afterwards. Um, okay, next up we have the Nanad Vasquez. Uh, the Nanad Vasquez is a multidisciplinary artist with a specific interest in using black and white film to make images that involve concepts of obsolescence, self-identity, and existentialism. Existentialism, sorry. Uh, he's most interested in the relationship between machines and humans and prefers to explore these ideas using a camera apparatus. Most recently, Vasquez has been creating time-based videos and sculptural pieces. He was selected for the Summer Studios 20, uh, 2022 residency from Project Row Houses and is one of the three winners of the Beth Block Honorariums from uh, Houston Center for Photography's the 40th Center Annual Exhibition. Uh, Vasquez earned his BFA in photography from the University of Houston. And uh, I will roll it over to Drenar. Hello. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen first. Looks good on our side. All right, cool. All right. <clears throat> All right, so, you know, I just want to say thank you for, you know, for everyone for being attending here and also thank you HCP for having us for uh, having this event and also Lisa for, you know, taking the time for us not taking time for like nominating us for an award. And I just want to start with uh, more of a technical <clears throat> aspect of my the project. And so I had two projects that I based on this, uh, this project on. And so the title is Falta de Documentos, which in English, it translates to lack of documentation. And so the first uh, project, I called it a, a blurred image, uh, blurred subjects, where I would just take pictures of like random and individuals as a subject matter and just blur their environment and just blur their faces. And there's uh, really nothing too special of it. It's just something that I'm very like, very like interested in. And um, <clears throat> so then the second project is called uh, Obsolescence of the Old New, which I'm taking portraits of former, like uh, portraits of furniture that I found in front of uh, other people's houses, because I feel that, you know, there's still an, ex uh, an extension of the former person that used to own it. So in other words, I'm taking like, a, like a, what I like to call an alternative portraiture. And so by combining these two uh, projects, I had the idea of having, being able to show the background and also, um, but with uh, my subjects, I would like blur them. And, um, and that's how I combined it, uh, like both, both projects into one for being the one at, at ATP. And I had a conversation with, uh, Lorena Molina, and uh, she's a she's a great artist, and she also has an uh, an exhibition open at Assembly, and I highly recommend you know for anyone to go check it out. And we had a conversation regarding like uh, this artist talk, and and she told me um, like what 
what's the reason how can I tie in all like all projects that I currently have into like one major idea I guess or one major theme and that came about um, I kept like pondering about that idea and that conversation and it was mostly about uh, taking an image or portrait of someone without them actually being there or the the or like the subject being blurred or obscured and it's something that I it's a current theme that I have in most of all my projects and also um that's how you know mostly like the last like you know most current project that I currently have and I guess like answering one of like you know the questions like uh why did I create this like project and it's it was mostly uh for my upbringing I'm I'm very I was um as a younger age, I was very exposed towards uh, a lot of individuals who didn't have any documentation in the United States, and I just wanted to create a a project that I can in put a platform for this marginalized group of individuals where I can also not exploit them in the sense of like their image. So that's why I chose to go towards the route of like blurring their faces but also sharing their environment and um yeah that's pretty much that's pretty much it all right um well thank you so much Jinnad. um if you don't mind unsharing your screen <laughs> um no thank you so much Jinnad. that was uh i think that gives a lot more insight to the work you have at hcp and uh oh man i just Personally, maybe I'm speaking for myself instead of the audience, but uh, the insight that I'm getting into all of y'all's work is really beautiful, and I want to put out questions, but I'll have to let Jamie talk before I put out all of you guys. Um, so anyway, yeah, thank you. Then let's move on to last but not least, Jamie Ho. Um, Jamie Ho is an interdisciplinary artist and educator from, oh gosh, Fort Myers, Florida. If I said that wrong, I'm sorry. Um, her art practice, her art practice engages with photography, new media, and installation to reinvestigate the long-term impact of assimilation and cultural bereavement through references to ancestral Chinese traditions and artifacts. She received her MFA at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in 2023. Shout out, and her BFA from the University of New Mexico. Shout out, shout out, in 2012. In 2012. 2012. Uh, she was a 2021 Critical Mass finalist and attended residencies such as Acre Residency and Vermont Studio Center. Her work has been published in Photographer's Green Book, Fraction Magazine, and Fifth World Press. She has exhibited nationally and had solo exhibitions at Art and Lecture Laboratory, Watkins Gallery at Winona State University, and more. The more I talk, the more y'all figure out how bad I am in English. Anyway, uh, last but not least, let's pass it over to Jamie Ho. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, it's, all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Andre, and um, thank you for organizing the event. Um, I'll just start. Um, my name is Jamie Ho, as um, mentioned previously, and I'll be giving a short introduction on how I got into photography. Um, and we'll be talking about my current work, Magic Mirrors, focusing primarily on gifts and the photographic elements of my practice. I was born and raised in a suburb of Florida called Fort Myers. It's located here. I got into photography because of my dad. As a kid, I found memories of my dad carrying around his Yashka FX3 during family vacations, or just to take a few pictures of my brother and me in our backyard, and it later became my first camera. When I was 12, I went to China to attend my grandmother's funeral, and I had all this reckless energy and uncertainty. And to help with that, my dad bought me disposable camera after disposable camera. And the pictures I took matched my franticness, blurry and out of focus. And I dismissed those efforts as a failure on my part rather than an experience. And so in high school, I decided it was okay to fail. And I took a photo class with my dad's Yashika and that here I am still making work through a lens-based process and embracing failure. My work considers my positionality, my presence and space in relation to where I am. And I started 
with an attempt to make visible in this work the process of assimilation that renders me both highly visible and invisible in the American landscape. My research led me to the legend of Chang'er. Chang'er is a Chinese moon goddess who became immortal because she either stole or was forced to take the herb of immortality and became imprisoned by the moon. And there is a feminist interpretation that sees Chang'er not as a thief or victim, but as a symbol of independence and liberation from the dominance of a patriarchal society as she flies away to the moon on her own terms. And that led me to Chinese magic mirrors. And so when a beam of bright light hits the convex and polished surface, an image is reflected back onto the wall. This is a description of a magic mirror, an object from the Han Dynasty, and one that's synonymous with how Euro-America views China, both technically advanced and shrouded in mystery. And the magic mirror also points to the history of photography, as this term was often used in the Victorian era to describe a camera. The image created from a camera is a mimic of reality, both all too familiar and unfamiliar. And so I use the magic mirror as a way to describe my experience as a second generation queer Chinese American. In this work, I use photography, gifts, sound, and installation techniques to trouble this long history of display and public spectacle of Chinese American women and femmes. An example of this history is Afo Moy, the first Chinese lady who was actively exhibited as a living exhibition from 1834 to 1850 before disappearing from record. And my body, like Moy's body, has been on the receiving end of public spectacle. And the displays I utilize in my work function as a disruption to the ways my body has been viewed. Like magic mirrors, the gifts I create generate mirror images revealing an alternate world that highlights the ways rituals are both private and public, and the ways my body cannot fit into the impossibility of Eurocentric beauty standards through the use of the backdrop of theoretical curtains, the framing of the spotlight to stage drag performances. In my marriage ceremony series, I play both groom and bride, the same exact hair and makeup. The only difference is my clothing, my actions mirroring each other until the bride takes both action and agency, subverting gender roles. The actions I take in these gifts, aided by stop motion jitters, are not overtly masculine or feminine. Instead, this work questions who be, should be unveiled and disrupts the roles the bride and groom typically follows. The groom traditionally unveils a bride and here the bride unveils herself, unveiled and chooses to unveil herself. In my work, I ask, what does it mean to be viewed as an object, to be fetishized and consumed? For Asian American femme bodies, it correlates with our experience with violence, from microexpressions to death. Gifts entered my work around the same time as the March 16, 2021 Atlanta Spa Massacre, where eight people were murdered, six of which were Asian women. And it led me to think about the many attempts I made to assimilate into the hegemony of American culture, yet assimilation is an impossible task, as my body will always be seen as perpetually foreign. Or as Kathy Park Hong writes in Minor Feelings, assimilation cannot be mistaken for power because once you've acquired power, you're exposed and your minor minority qualifications that helped you in the past can be used against you since you're no longer invisible, end quote. Yep. <laughs> The cone ceremony contains audio from my cousin's own cone ceremony where you're hearing my aunt dictate to my uncle what to do before they all chant together. And this gif is meant to be heard and seen alongside the two other gifts that you just saw. And it brings a level of joy and stoic to the stoic and robotic nature of the gif. And on the left is the translation my mother sent me which she had run through Bing. It translates to comb to the end, two combs of white hair and eyebrows, three combs of children and grandchildren are all over the ground. So drawing from my mother's flawed knowledge regarding ancestral rituals, I create gifts that simulate these traditions as an alternative to assimilation. The missing moments or frames in the gift function in the same way traditions do when passed down generationally. They morph over time, but gifts also loop 
continuously, and in this case, this work is trapped in these, um, the same kind of manifestation that I create. And in place of missing information or frames, there's also room for subversion. Absurdity is a main component of this. In this work, Home to the End, which also exists as a still photograph in the exhibition, I'm referencing a marriage ceremony ritual where hair is combed from top to end, past the edges of the frame. I'm presenting the comb just as a beauty influencer on YouTube presents makeup and beauty objects, but I'm using hands that are covered in pantyhose to do so. These hands that look like Barbie doll hands or cat paws are not hands, but instead a representation of them. And by placing nails on the pantyhose, they morph and shift as I move. Pantyhose also bounds my hands, restricting and creating challenges to my movement. And they show an impossibility to meet and adhere to this idealization of Eurocentric beauty. Repetition in the gifts also refers to transformation of time in the same way crip time bends time to create more forgivable and flexible approaches for disabled bodies and minds, ones that live outside of normative timeframes. Ellen Samuels writes, crip time is time travel. Disability and illness have the power to extract us from linear progressive time with its normative life stages and cast us into a wormhole of backward and forward acceleration. Jerky stops and starts tedious intervals and abrupt endings. I both disrupt and critique the ways Chinese American femme bodies are objectified through an orientalist and ableist lens. The lotus foot gift, which can also be viewed at the exhibition, references foot binding, a Chinese custom banned in 1912 that bound young girls' feet to conform to social norms. In the way the foot transforms, the lotus becomes more clear and then disappears as if nothing happens which relates to the way treatments for chronic disabilities provide a sense of normacy. Yet in this gif, the foot never fits perfectly into the shoe and the constant loop never relents. The foot is in constant transformation. The same way treatment and failing of treatments places those disabled still in a perpetual state of precarity. Um, I uploaded a past iteration of this work to YouTube and I was immediately notified that this work was in community violation. YouTube algorithm viewed this gif of my foot just a part of my body and recognized the Chinese-ness of the objects and patterns and decided to flag it. Like photography, algorithms are not neutral. Their code was written by a human being and follows parameters set by countless videos a human being deemed to be in violation. And by seeing this gif as a violation of policy, this directs, directly points to Euro America's over-sexualization of Asian American women and femme bodies. Orientalism is not in the past and instead is still pervasive and exists in normalized ways. And Orientalism in the Orient is almost certainly a European construction or as Said states in reference to the play, The Parisians, a highly artificial enactment of what a non-Oriental has made into a symbol for the whole Orient. In my work, I'm creating an interruption to these narratives by critiquing the power structures that render my body as displayed ornament. Though I'm referencing Chinese historical objects and current experiences within Chinese diaspora, my work is future facing, building a reality where the horizon is infinite and absurdly beautiful, absent of the pressures to conform to societal constructs that are how normative and able body. I'm creating an alternate place to not just exist freely and safely, but also to have joy and humor and play. Thank you. I really appreciate y'all coming and I appreciate all your time and thank you for Houston Center for Photography for having me in my work. Absolutely, thank you so much, Jamie, for sharing your work with us. Um, thank you, Jamie, Drenat, and Robin, to all three of you for uh, taking the time to give us more insight into your practice. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm beyond honored that you guys have the, not only the capability to make amazing work, but the capability to just like speak so like avidly and so beautifully about what you guys have to, what you guys have to bring forth. Um, now, uh, I won't talk, well, I'm probably going to talk off a lot, but um, 
Now, uh, since the artist talks are over, I would like to, we, we're still going to collect questions, um, but it's a little bit of an intimate group. So I think it might be best for those of you that would like to, to unmute yourself uh, and ask any questions directly. If anyone doesn't have any questions, best believe I have plenty of questions, um, but I would like to uh, give the opportunity, especially now that the artist talks are over to anyone in the audience that would like to unmute themselves and speak directly to any of the artists. Fine, because I'm about to go out, y'all. Oh, no, for real. But is, does anyone have any? I'm about to go. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> I like that. So, Brian, hello. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, uh, this question is for Jamie. Um, well, first of all, thank you um, for like, this great insight into your practice. Um, I've always been curious as to like how you've incorporated gifts into your your photographic practice. And I'm curious as to like how you view gifts in relation to like video as a, or as opposed to video um do you feel it gives you a little more like flexibility in terms of because it's so the looping nature of gifts is so similar to like the static uh nature of like a photograph or the still nature of a photograph does it give you like us in video for example uh, i'm just curious like technically how you think of that in terms of like um the comparison between the two and why you choose one over the other as opposed to the other um why i choose gifts over still photographs or gifts oh, over over? over video for example over like other methods of like moving image yeah thank you ryan for your question um and hi, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um that's great that's a great question um and it's something that i think about a lot um for me gifts really directly points to photography or the way I use GIFs because I create stop motion animation. So my work is comprised of still images that are put together and then continuously loop. And I think there's still a quality to it where I'm able to manipulate how things transform and how things are viewed, especially in relationship to this like this critique on this orientalist lens is like this critique on how Euro America may view the Asian American community or the Asian community in general, um, because there is this like idea of mysticism of the the East, and so I think a lot about through stop motion animations and through gifts the possibilities of trans transformation and how I can utilize it to make that critique. Um, I think video is still really interesting, but I like that ability that gifts have. Um, and I know that I am pushing the boundaries of what a gif is because some of my gifts are can be fairly long and I incorporate sound often in them, but that's the main reason why um, I like to use gifts over videos. Thank you, thank you. That's, uh, that's really awesome to hear i was just curious as to like you know your thought process behind that that explains a lot thank you thanks ryan thank you ryan um does anyone else have any uh other questions in the chat right now okay because i'm really about to just go off on y'all because this is really exciting for me um so to piggyback off of Ryan's question, um, and this is for all of you, maybe Dranat and Robin first, um, because Jamie just spoke, um, but I realized that photography is pretty integral to all of your practice. I, was, I wrote down the photography and the image. So I'm curious uh, to each of you, um, what, what draws you to photography as far as why do you use that medium to speak about what you wanna speak about? And secondly, what are the limitations of photography as well? Because each of you guys are pushing beyond some of the traditions. I mean, Robin, like your work is the most traditional, but that being said, it's quite meticulous and very different than what the norm is in 2023 for making images. So I'm curious, that's a long version of being like to each of you, what are what draws you to photography, but also what do you respect as some of the limitations that you need to push beyond and anyone can start? Um, I can I can start with um, so the what draws me to photography is the I guess the challenging part of like 
trying to invoke your own ideas or invoke your own like um I guess agenda of like what you want to like say but and only in the still image and I feel like it's very difficult to like try to photograph a certain thing and trying to push it out there as like you know this is my work and but this is what I'm trying to like convey and just convey a, like something bigger than than you or anything in general into just one image and a still image too mm -hmm. that's what really like draws me into photography. That makes total sense. Like, that, that, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, uh, for, for me, it's the historical nature of photography. Um, it was the first medium that allowed um, self-emancipated folks to actually have uh, a way of, of, of expression and uh, kind of taking back the narrative that there was this, um, you know, inferiority and in how it was used in anthropological and ethnographic type of studies. And so it was a way to take that uh, narrative and reframe it. Um, and so photography, um, besides, you know, we have this Eurocentric idea of high and low art mm -hmm. and you know, uh, during those periods, you know, you got these idealized photo uh, uh, paintings and all these other things. And so uh, photography was a way for me to really engage with the historical nature, the way of rep uh, that um, way of, of gaining your um, your own identity and uh, being able to to tell the story or the narrative that you want. I mean, you know, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, all of these um, uh, folks who were out there fighting abolition, uh, abolitionists and everything else, they use it. You know, what did Sojourner Truth say? You know, I, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Mm -hmm. And so you start thinking about those kind of things. And for me, that's what it does. And that's why historical print, printing, 19th century process. Um, but I also use, sometimes it doesn't, the still image doesn't tell the entire story. There's a lot of missing information in, in, um, in Black history, and mm -hmm. you can't tell that story with just one still image. You have to use other mechanisms. It could be video, it could be digital mixed media collage. Mm -hmm. Just, but photography is always a foundational aspect for me. Everything I do starts with photography. Even if I'm writing, it starts with photography. Feel that. I think a lot of us feel that in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you for sharing. And Jamie, did you have uh, something to add? Yeah, um, I definitely agree with Robin. Like for me, my work starts in photography, but I think what draws me to photography in part is it's the ability to create a mirror of reality, but do so in a way that um, can, that I, that I can essentially create a new world myself if I wanted to. I think there's just so much possibilities um, in photography and that there isn't really a limit to it. And I, even in my installation work and even in my gifts, I, it starts with the photograph and it starts with like the history of portraiture and like how people are depicted. So mm -hmm. that was, that's what draws me to photography. Oh my gosh, that's great. I love the insight to all of y'all's practice. And I also really love the through line. I don't, I don't know if this was on purpose. Uh, I can't speak for Lisa, but you know, there's such a, there's very much like a connection between the ways you guys are handling and reclaiming specifically the image as people that are mar as marginalized people, you know, as people of color, reclaiming the image in response to a white canon is, 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 uh, for lack of a better word, <laughs> effing amazing. Uh, we're recording, so I'm not going to say the word. Um, and on that note, uh, and do you have any questions? Okay, go ahead, because girl, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, through. actually, because it, and also, <laughs> it, it does a nice job of 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 feeding off of the comment that you just made. Um, I, I just I, this is both a comment and then a follow up question. But one of the things that I think is particularly fascinating, amazing, um, heartwarming, um, it's significant, important, uh, you know, critical in this moment is that each in each of your works, but perhaps especially in Robin and Jamie's 
there's both agency that's being created. Um, that to me is, is, you know, critical in this moment, but there's also a, a re-scripting or a scripting perhaps of and, and an insertion into the historical canon. And so there's, there's two things that for me, I see happening. There's the agency of this moment but in both cases, taking historical references and, and putting into those historical references or, or insisting upon inserting into those historical references a more complete um, identity, a more complete script of what that historical reference could and should include. And that to me is, is something that, again, I think part of that is the agency of the moment, but it's also part of how I think in this moment history, the history of photography and the canon of photography is being reckoned with. Um, and I would love for you all to talk about the significance of that from the standpoint of um, as artists in this moment, um, why making that choice and standing that ground um, hasn't been important for you in your practice as an artist. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um. I can go if you like. Um, I think um, for me um, personally, just the 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 ability to use theory and criticism to inform your work, it puts you in a mindset that you're interrogating visual language every time, everywhere you go, and everything that you do, and um, that really informs my work and particularly. Um, uh theoretical concepts like the black atlantic with paul gilroy or um uh tina camp's work and 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 talking about haptics and um or you know audrey lord or um uh, bell hooks and talking about power structure structures it's just taking those images and having a conversation about how past issues are directly related to these contemporary issues that we're, we're dealing with now. And I felt it was important, particularly because I was assigned. I, I've always been an artist at heart, but I was in the business world. And um, that was my, my focus. But my uncle was uh, a painter, owned a sign shop, but he was dealing with Alzheimer's from um, the Vietnam War and Agent Orange. And as he was, uh, his memory was deteriorating, he came to me and asked me to take this on and make sure that we I tell the story of, uh, of our family. You know, I just thought it was just simple, just simple story, the same thing, you know, same uh, uh, racist constructs, all that. I didn't think there was much difference, but using photography to have those conversations about historical narratives and how they're so similar to contemporary narratives. So. For me, that's that's really um, what and how I've I've really focused on on engaging with contemporary issues and and providing a legacy to move conversations forward. So, yeah, um, for me, it's you know, I think during the pandemic there was a rise of anti-Asian hate. And a lot of it, you know, um, was there before, but uh, I felt like there was a lot um, specifically happening because of the, the current president at the time. Um, and I also felt that um, as someone who's second generation, who um, distance from my parents, you know, um, from China where my parents are from, is it's a lot and there's a, addition, a, a difference a distance generationally as well and I was and I you know um I I think a lot about like how can I make these connections despite despite that and how can I reimagine these traditions and and consider the past that hasn't um, been talked about a lot and how can I make it, bring it to the forefront? Um, and so that in itself is the, um, the purpose of my work, but also to like, as I mentioned in my talk, to find humor and spontaneity and joy in that um, because we're living in 
a society that um, is that makes it really difficult for people, especially um, people in marginalized groups, to thrive. That um, I just want to like consider and create our world build a place where I can just I, that we can just exist and find joy and and thrive essentially. Absolutely. Um, well, I kind of have one more question. Um, it's 6.55 and I don't want to, okay, cool. We got one more. Cool. These actually, uh, this, the last two questions were directed towards, um, Jamie and Robin. I have this last question that was forward or not, but I think it kind of can be, uh, you know, spread to each of you. Um, so feel free to answer, uh, afterwards, but you're not, I'm going to ask you first. Um, but the question specifically was, uh, as I looked at your work, that is about, uh, not just, family and community. I mean, it's it's about family and community in multiple ways. It's about maybe the people that are within your specific life. Uh, I imagine like, you know, the work of the HCP, people that you can go into their homes and have a relationship with, but also the work that is portraits of people without people in them, of the things that people own that are within the community. And so I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering a couple of things, actually. I'm wondering one, um, is it important for you to make work that is familial? Um, and if so, why is it important to make work that's familial? And I mean that from a personal standpoint, maybe, uh, if it is a personal thing, um, but also why is it important to make familial work in the context of being, I don't know, of making work about marginalized communities? Um, and so I'm wondering why, why, what draws you to making work like that specifically? Um, I guess, uh, hmm, that's a really good question. <laughs> Is it, yeah, it's like, it's, I guess those questions that like, I still like, like ask myself to this day and like, I, I was like, you know, like trying to like figure out my own artistic, like reasonings as well. It's very like somewhat challenging at times, but sorry about that. Um, but yeah, uh, you said the why is making work familiar towards me? Uh, yeah, why is um, making work that is familial in a sense? So like, why does work that make, why does it, why is it important to you to make work that um, is relative to your specific experience? I think it, I guess, um, I guess in a way it could probably like be more impactful if it's like something I guess, uh, close to home, I guess, or close to like, you know, towards oneself. I feel like that's, that's the reason why I create work that, you know, has like some form of portraiture, because I feel like, I feel like, you know, portrait, everyone is like drawn towards like, you know, the image of someone. But, you know, that's why like, I try to go against that in a way mm -hmm. by like creating work that the person's not there or like just objects or found objects. So I feel like that's why I'm gravita gravitating towards like, you know, that, towards that direction. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That makes sense. Um, now, uh, that Jamie or Robin, did either of you feel like you wanted to answer that question or feel like that's where to be your work? I want to give you the option before we close it out. Can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, um, it's like to be a millionaire, I wish. Uh, <laughs> the question is, um, it, if you make work that is familial or personal, like from your direct experience with life, why is it important for you to make work like that? And why do you do it? Yeah, I think um, for me, my work is an act of refusal. It's mm -hmm. refusing uh, historic narratives. and I feel like I am um, the mechanism for um, those who have been invisible to make them visible. And particularly it being associated with my family and dealing with it on a personal journey. Um, you know, I think I, I said during the presentation that I, I moved from a far and wide perspective, just kind of looking at the institution of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, right? Just, just whole system of, of, um, of uh, slavery. I, I moved from that perspective and looked at it more in a theoretical 
uh, lens, and for instance, with Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic, and started looking at things, okay, if we're talking about um, the Black Atlantic, meaning that there's routes and routes from uh, the continent of Africa through the Atlantic Ocean, which one of those routes am I in, right? And which one of those routes did my family derive from? And how um, is it so uh, similar to have family members that everyone has a garden in their backyard or um, everyone likes to stay busy, right? These same consistent, consistent variables in your family. And so it's a lot easier for me to speak from that perspective about what I'm familiar with um, uh, to talk about contemporary issues versus uh, talking about it in this generic way. You know, everyone can talk about a generic aspect, but you can't, you know, it's really becomes personal. When you personalize it, it becomes a, a, a lot more potent conversation um, otherwise. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. I really appreciate that. And Jamie? Yeah, I just, I want to keep it pretty short because I feel like I said it a few times, but my work, you know, comes from my experiences. It comes from growing up and feeling um, unable to assimilate, which is impossible and also like something that I'm glad I'm not striving for now, but it's <laughs> a <little> journey <laughs> and it took time for me to figure it out um, longer than I wanted to. And it, it's work that I think um to make work about it is I think really important to me to express but and it happens to also talk about all these other issues that are happening currently um and so so yeah thank you thank you for sharing that I I uh didn't intend to make it so heartfelt but I think that that's a beautiful thing to end on in the sense that maybe I'm biased but I'm just like uh I think it's really important that we as human beings learn from other people's experience, especially those that we have the privilege to not like have to experience. I mean, like I, I will never know what it's like to be a, a non-black, non-nobodied person, but I respect each and every single person who's not and it, it is able to make work and put it in front of my face so that I can learn more about those experiences. So to each and every one of you, Jamie, Dinanath and Rodman, like thank you absolutely for the work that you're doing. It is not just beautiful, it is didactic and important. And I am very, I'm honored to have been one of the people to help put it on the walls. So thank you guys so much for this. Um, thank you so much to each and every one of you, to our guests as well this evening. It is so important to have events like this so that we can, in fact, learn from each of you and share in the incredible work that you're making. HCP thanks you. Um, I thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all in the gallery soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's it, everyone. Um, Yes, as, as Anne mentioned, hopefully you'll be in the gallery soon. The exhibition ends on August the 20th. So get your bus in here for the next two and a half weeks and you'll have time to see the exhibition. Uh, and if, as normal, if you have any questions, me and Anne are always at HCP and always may reach by email and our email's on the website. I'm not going to put them in here right now. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for, uh, for everything and thanks for attending everybody. I hope that everyone has a, an amazing evening regardless of where you are, uh, where you're at in the world. Um, and I'll see you next time, whenever that'll be. All right, I'm not going to end. I'm going to, oh, yeah, I have to stop the recording. <laughs>